Brendan, good to see you all in the hall and to anyone that's listening online, give you a warm welcome. Now, can you turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 3 and uh, verse 14? Now, I'm going to read a few scriptures uh, this afternoon, but you don't have to turn to them all if you don't want to. It'll just be a short verse here and there. But just to introduce the message today, um, we were at Edinburgh Castle. I've not been to Edinburgh Castle since I was a wee lad, but we went recently um, during the school holidays, and uh, it's quite expensive to get in nowadays, just that's a warning. And uh, we, we sort of traipsed around with the family, and we're in one of the chambers. It looked like a bit of a courtroom. And um, there was the, the Royal Cipher. Now, you may think, what on earth is a Royal Cipher? But you'll recognise that that is, for example, ER2. And, of course, we'll soon now be CR3, I think. And on the wall was the Royal Cipher, but it was IR. IR. Now, some very intelligent people in the room, I'm sure, tonight. You will know what that means, won't you? Well, Matt asked, and it was a very fair question, asked his dad, as you do, uh, what's IR? And for parents here, that's one of these awkward situations where you're like, oh, no. I should know this. I do know this. Why don't I know this? So uh, it was in there somewhere. I couldn't quite get there. So we asked the man, the tour guide, and he gave a really fascinating discussion on it, actually. He was telling us about how um, it was ER2, but of course that's controversial in Scotland because she's actually Queen Elizabeth the First in Scotland, so apparently when ER2 first started going up, there was mailboxes getting destroyed because that was controversial. I didn't know that, it was good to know. And then we were saying how it's going to be a CR3, and then he said, of course, that the R is Latin for Queen or for King, and as soon as he mentioned the word Latin, I turned to man, I told them the answer. Because the I R, well, the I is Jacobus. Now, we're going to get even more in depth here. I did Latin at school. I mean, it's quite ridiculous, isn't it? Who does Latin at school? What a waste of time. Anyway, sorry if you did Latin at school, by the way. I remember there was there's only 23 letters in the Latin alphabet. Did you know that? Uh, and there's no J. So when there is a J, there is an I. So James, King James, the sixth of Scotland and first of England, was IR, which is Jacobus, which is, of course, Latin for James, and it's an I for J. So as soon as he said Latin, I, I could follow it through uh, to its conclusion. Now, you might say, Mark, this is a tremendously whimsical and boring story you're telling. You know, where are you going with this? Well, I actually had just spoke a couple of weeks before on the name of God in the Old Testament, Jehovah. Now... There are some younger people here. I'm not going to look at the older people. They'll not even let on. But there's a very famous film with a very famous actor called Sean Connery in it. And he actually, in one of the very famous scenes, says the fact that in Latin, Jehovah starts with an I. Now, maybe you can tell me afterwards what that movie is if you don't know. I'm, I'm assuming most don't know because most won't watch movies in here. Anyway, Jehovah. I want to talk about the name of God in the Old Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, written, of course, in Hebrew, originally, and we're very fortunate to have it in our own tongue, but written originally in Hebrew, names are important, and they're much more important than today in English, because names don't just identify people, they actually tell you about their identity. They don't just identify people with the principal reason for a name, but often, in, in, certainly in the Bible, they also tell you about the person's identity. So let's go to Exodus chapter 3 in verse 14. And the context here is the burning bush, and Moses goes to the burning bush because God has something to tell Moses. He wants Moses to go and to deliver his people from Egypt. And we don't have time to go into that, but it's a fascinating thing we can read about in the scriptures. And Moses asked the question of God. He asked a few questions, but he says, well, who shall I say sent me? And God reveals himself and his name. I think it's fascinating, isn't it? What do we think God would say? He says, who shall I say sent me? And what does God say in verse 14? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. When God declares who he is, he says, I am that I am. Now, this is the Hebrew word Yahweh. This is the word in the Old Testament for the Lord, Yahweh. And it's a phenomenal word. 
because it tells us about the identity of God. Now, you're here tonight for a gospel message in the Gospel Hall in Perth. You know, I assume that you're open to the concept that there's a God. It would be a strange thing if you're a staunch atheist and reject outright there's a God. God says, I am that I am. And the word Yahweh really means to be. And God really says this. I am the self-existent, all-powerful, eternal God. That's how he reveals himself. I am that I am. That's who God is. Isn't it wonderful? And that's how he reveals himself and how uh, he says to Moses that you should say, send me. That's the word Yahweh. It's a word that's used well over 5,000 times in the Old Testament. You know, I was reading recently, and you probably know this, that the Jewish people today in their Bible, Old Testament, they just have YHWH, they don't have the vowels. Now, I, I work for a company that's taken the vowels out of its name. It seems to be trendy these days. It gets a lot of people mock, it, mock us for that. But nonetheless, the Jewish people have taken the vowels out. And the concept here is that name is almost too holy to say. And when they read the Bible out loud, they don't say Yahweh, it's too holy. They don't want to utter the word. Instead, they say Adonai, Lord. So they use Adonai instead of Yahweh. But it's this word, I am, it is to be the self-existing, self-sustaining, all-powerful, eternal God. But as I mentioned, from the Hebrew, translated is Yahweh, is translated into Jehovah. And it just means Lord. It just means Lord. So I want us to, the, this afternoon, to think about this word Jehovah in the Old Testament. We've already found out who God is. But we're going to find out a lot more about God uh, and some of the references in the Old Testament to the word Jehovah. So the first one is in Genesis 22 and 14. I say you don't have to turn to it. I think we're going to look at five, I think. And this is not an exhaustive list, clearly. Um, but for our gospel message this afternoon, we're going to find out a lot more about this self-existent, all-powerful God. So it says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 14, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah, there's the word, Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, Jehovah Jireh. Now that is translated the Lord who provides, the Lord who provides. Now this is a fascinating chapter in God's word. And it talks about the incident where God told Abraham, who he made many promises to, many great promises, to take his only son, Isaac, up Mount Moriah. And God was testing his faith, Abraham's faith. He wanted to see if Abraham would trust them fully. You know, faith is very, very important. And so much so that Abraham was willing to put his own son onto an altar to the fact that it feels like he was actually sacrificing his own son. That's a horrific thing, isn't it? I mean, how, who would do that? But of course, God had never any intention for that to be the case. God was simply testing this man's faith, and he found that he was faithful. He says, no harm is going to come upon your son. And the Bible tells us there was a ram caught in the thicket. And God says, take the ram and offer the ram as a sacrifice. It's an incredible chapter. It's a wonderful chapter because a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? And we're learning here about a God who will provide. Well, what, what is God going to provide? Well, he provides many things. But the biggest message in the Bible and the message for us today is that God has provided his own son as a saviour. And Isaac is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ because God was going to give his only son as a sacrifice for us. He is a substitutionary sacrifice. God gave his son to be crucified on the cross at Calvary to pay the price for your sin and for my sin. He would never let Abram do that to his own son. But isn't it amazing what God, I am that I am, has done for us? He gave his own son as a sacrifice for our own sin. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing for us to consider this evening. Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides now let's go to another one in Exodus 15 and verse 26. And again, say, turn to it if you want, Exodus 15 and verse 26. So the self-existent God who is, 
a God who provides. And the next is 1526. It says this. And say, if thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these, these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. So this is another Yahweh verse. I am the Lord that healeth thee. So a God who provides, a God who heals. Well, that's good, isn't it? Now, in the context of this chapter, he has delivered his people out of Egypt, and he used Moses partly to do that, of course. And they are just come out with a tremendous victory for God's children, children of Israel. But it doesn't take long before the grumbling begins, and there's a problem in this place called Mara with the water. It was very bitter. It was hard to drink. And God told Moses to take a tree, a tree of healing, and to put it in the water. And the water went from being bitter to sweet, and it was, it was lovely to the taste. Now, many a good gospel message will have been preached, I'm sure, from here about the significance of trees in the Bible. God said of the tree in Genesis, don't eat of the fruit of that tree. You've got all the fruit in the garden to eat. Don't eat of the fruit of this tree. And of course, Adam and Eve took the fruit and they sinned, and sin entered into the world. And we know, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we mentioned, went to the cross at Calvary, a tree, and he was crucified there for you and for me. And we know, of course, the Bible finishes with a tree in mind as well, which I've not got time to think about. So a very interesting study is, is trees um, in the scriptures. But ultimately, the water wasn't bitter anymore. And the people were healed. God healed. Now it says in Romans chapter 3, sorry, I'm sorry, I just lost my place here. It says um, in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus Christ healed. The Lord Jesus Christ healed. And it seems of... Um, Psalm 103, God who forgives all our iniquities, sins, and who heals all our diseases, forgives all our iniquities, all our sins, and he heals all our diseases. Now, that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. When the Lord Jesus Christ was here on the earth, people came to him with all manners of diseases. People wanted to be healed of leprosy, of being blind, of being deaf, of being dumb. Some couldn't walk. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he healed them all. He healed them all, just as it said in the Psalms. But there was a day when a man was lowered down from the ceiling. He was paralyzed. He'd been paralyzed from birth. And his friends lowered him down to the place where the Lord was. And the Lord said to that man, my sins are forgiven me. Now this caused a commotion because the people of the day and the religious scholars of the day knew that only God can forgive sins. And they were confused and they were angry. But the Lord Jesus was teaching as the Son of God, who had come from heaven and taken on flesh, born into this world, that he had the power to forgive sins. That was the big thing. He then, of course, healed the man of his paralysis and says to him, take up your bed and walk, and he did. But the bigger thing was that he could heal them of their sins, or in other words, forgive him of his sins. So God has not just provided a saviour, his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God has provided one who can heal us, who can forgive us of our sins if we simply trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross at Calvary. So this spe uh, specific reference in Exodus chapter 15 is Jehovah Rapha in the original Hebrew, the Lord who heals. Now I want to go to another one, Jeremiah chapter 23, please. Jeremiah 23. So we're learning the God who is. We're learning the God who provides. We're learning the God who heals. And then in Jeremiah 23 and verse 5, we're going to see another one. This is also quite a well-known one. Uh, Jehovah Tzidkenu. Jehovah Tzidkenu is the original uh, translation. Uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in all the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. We're learning about the identity of God. You know, when God is holy, 
and God is just and God is true and God is love. We learn these things from the, the Bible. But God is also righteous. He is the Lord of our righteousness. This is one of his principal characteristics. The Lord is righteous. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, in contrast, looking at us, there is none that are righteous, no, not one. None that are righteous, no, not one. We need God's righteousness. If we ever want to be in God's heaven, if we ever want to spend eternity with God, we can never be there in our sins. And the Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of his glory. We need to be righteous and we can never be self-righteous. We can only be in heaven with God, with God's righteousness. It says in Romans chapter 1 that the righteous live by faith. It's never done by works. It's done by faith. Those that have their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are deemed as righteous. And the same book tells us that God's righteousness is revealed through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder tonight, have you trusted in the Lord Jesus? Do you know that in the eyes of God you are righteous, forgiven of your sins, and fit for eternity in heaven because you are clothed with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know that for sure? That's Jehovah Sikandi, the Lord who is righteous. Now, Murray McShane, who I think is from Dundee, Ali will know the answer to that, yes, he's northern. He's from Dundee, a very famous uh, preacher. Many people saved in Scotland through the preaching of, of Murray McShane did write a few hymns, and I believe that his most famous hymn was indeed entitled Jehovah uh, Sikenu. And one of the verses says, My terrors all banished before his sweet name. My guilty fears banished. With boldness I came to drink at the fountain, life-giving and free. Jehovah Sikenu is all things to me. A wonderful hymn, uh, lovely words. The Lord, our righteousness. Now, I've just got two more before we finish. And we're going to look at Judges chapter 6 and verse 24, just briefly. And this is Jehovah Shalom. And if you're a linguist, you'll probably know how, how this translates, Jehovah Shalom, because just Shalom is a, a very well-used word uh, with the Jews today in Hebrew. Of course, it means peace. So this is the Lord, our peace, in Judges chapter 6 and verse uh, 24. Get my fingers working there. We've Judges chapter 6, verse 24. And it says there, Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day is yet an offer of the Abyssalites. I think that's how you pronounce that. So Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Now the context here is before the kings, there were judges, God raised men and women actually as judges to correct the people as they disobeyed him and went off on their own. And uh, here, God appears to Gideon and Gideon wanted a sign from God. And the God, when God revealed himself and Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord that was speaking to him, he was very distressed because he thought he might die, remembering that man could not look at God and live. But in this case, God says to him, fear not, peace be unto thee. That is the context of the chapter. So it's the God of peace, the Lord of peace. I want to ask you a simple question. Are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with God? Well, the Bible says if we're still in our sins, and we've not had our sins forgiven, and we're not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, that we are not at peace with God. Indeed, we're at enmity with God. It says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. It says in Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has made it possible for us to be at peace with God because he paid the price for sin on the cross and he shed his precious blood. Those that put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as it says here, are at peace with God. I wonder if you're at peace. That is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. So let's go to the final one. So we've looked at the God who is, the self-sustaining eternal God, 
We've looked at Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, the God who heals, the God our righteousness, the God our peace. And we're going to finish with um, the very final one, and it is in Ezekiel chapter 48 and verse 35. This one's probably a little bit more obscure, but the thought here is absolutely lovely, especially for Christians. Ezekiel chapter 48 and verse 35. And it says there, and this is a prophecy, it was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. That's Jehovah Shammah in the original Hebrew, the Lord is there. Not our title for God, the Lord is there. Now again, this was a specific prophecy in the Old Testament, and it was a specific prophecy given to God's chosen earthly people in Israel. But it speaks of a future for Israel as a nation, um, which at the moment is really separated uh, from God by sin and by idolatry and by rejecting, rejecting his word. But it's talking about bringing Israel back and redeeming them. And it's talking about a city and a reign that is to come with the Lord Jesus Christ on earth, really. And the name of the city is the Lord is there, it says in Ezekiel. But I want to just take that for us today in Cowden Beath, and I want us to think about us, for those of us that are Christians, for those of us that are believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know for certainty, and we were thinking about this earlier, that there's a day coming when we shall be with the Lord. And that will be either when we die on this earth, or if the Lord comes first, because the Bible does say he's coming again to take those that belong to him to be with himself. We don't know when that will happen, but many of us believe it could be soon. At that point, whatever comes first, we are going to go to be with the Lord. And we shall see him as he is. And even consequent to that in the future, the Bible talks about a time when a new heaven and a new earth will be created by God. And there will be an eternal state. And there will be no death. And there will be no pain. And there will be no crying. And there will be no sorrow. And there will be no sin. And as we think about heaven and the eternal state, what an incredible place it must be. But above all these wonderful truths, and it describes streets of gold, etc., in the Bible, the greatest thing of, of all is that the Lord will be there and we will be with the Lord. And that is the hope of the Christian, that they're going to go someday to be with the Lord. And it's a wonderful blessing for those that know him and know for certain that that will happen. I wonder, do you know for certain that if you were to die tonight, or indeed if the Lord was to come back for his own, will you go to be with the Lord? Now, if you don't, you can and you should. And the Bible tells us to know for certain you simply need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God, given by the Father, came into this world, lived a perfect life, gave his life on the cross at Calvary, paid the price for our sins. If we trust in him, he forgives us our sins. And we have an eternal destiny in heaven. We will be with the Lord. So hopefully that was interesting, maybe a little bit obscure. But the names of God in the Old Testament, it really is a fascinating thought, isn't it? Who is God? Well, he's a self-existing, self-sustaining, eternal one. But we learn so much more about him in the Bible. He loves us. He gave his son for us. He provides, he heals, he's our righteousness, he's our peace. And hopefully for each and every one in the hall tonight, we will all be with him one day in heaven.